Um, basically, there have been two new algorithm functions added. There's one that's called feature, and there's another called feature map. And essentially, what this does is it allows you to override uh, parameters that you may have set in your features.conf file, but just for the specific channel. So, for instance, if you have some person calling in and, and you, for whatever reason, felt like he might be more at home using a different set of DTMF uh, presses in order to perform, say, an intended transfer or a one-touch park or something along those lines, you can use the feature map function in order to set a new value for that. You can also use these uh, functions in order to read the values as well, in case you're just curious. Um, <laughs> Why did I set my configuration file? Exactly, right? <laughs> and you can, and that also, I mean, it allows you to vary things depending on time of day, who it is that's calling, all those fun things. Uh, and this uh, comes to us thanks uh, in part to Russell Bryant for taking the time to do it. And I believe it was Alistair who actually came up with the idea and posted the bounty for it, and Russell jumped all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Open source business at work. Yep. Um, this is this was all the community, and this was really cool because we we called we put out a call for IPv6 support for various parts of Asterisk that does not yet receive IPv6 support, and Sean Bright and Michael Young, between the two of them, took care of external IVR, fast AGI, AMI, and the SIP security event framework. So you know we're continuing to push IPv6 support into, diff into different parts of Asterisk, and it's getting close. We're getting very close to the point where everything's got IPv6 support. <laughs> Plug it in your mark. That's me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, another idea that Gunther and Thomas came up with was, uh, well, the initial idea they had was actually that they just wanted to expand the number of call groups and pickup groups to beyond 64, I believe, or 128, whatever. It is. 64. 64. And so initially they just said, let's make this a bigger number so that you have more bits and such. But we said, we can do it better. Uh, not we as in we can do it better. But or you can do it better. Um, basically, the idea is instead of just increasing that number so you now have a new ceiling, let's do something that allows for an unlimited number of pickup groups and call groups and also allows for them to have some sort of actual meaning other than just a number. So as you can see in this example, you may have originally had your call group and pickup groups and it's just some collection of numbers. Who knows what number two and number 13 mean? Whereas in this new way, you have the named call group and named pickup group and they actually have some sort of meaning to them. So they're kind of nice. Um, you'll also notice that it actually has a new name for the option. And the reason for that is because people want to quite possibly want to stick with the old method just when they're doing an upgrade or something so they don't have to do any sort of changes. If they want to take advantage of the new functionality, they have to specify it using the new names for the options. Name ACL. So this is pretty cool. So this, this was contributed by Ollie. Um, and it probably didn't mean everything that, that he had originally in his branch, but it's a good starting point for, for some of the name ACL functionality that he originally envisioned. Um, this actually lets you actually build out ACLs that have names. Shocking. You might sense a common theme on some of these kinds of things. Um, and what's very nice is that they can actually be referenced by all consumers of ACL information. So if you have something you want to block, you block it once in your named ACL, and then Eeks and SIP and Manager can all reference that ACL and say, yep, you know, my common ACL block, block it, right? So they all can take, it, take uh, advantage of that information. And it lets you template them out and do some really kind of nice things. And again, that same sort of thing, rather than requiring you know all, all this information specified for each individual particular endpoint, it lets you just take a handle, take a name, fly where you want it to go use it. Okay, so um, one thing that Asterisk has support for now um, is course, and I'll be perfectly honest with the, with all of you, I'm not 100 percent sure what all uh, it is, but I know <laughs> I know that it's uh, our use of chorusing in this case is it replaced a module called uh, Res AIS. AIS was a, or I guess still is, a uh, standard for distributing uh, information between systems. The problem is we were using a, an implementation of AIS called OpenAIS, which is essentially an abandoned project at this point. And Chorusync is sort of the new hotness in that regard, and it you know does everything that we needed it to and is an actively maintained project. So Russell Bryant contributed 
res corsing file that essentially does distributed events um, in the same way that res AIS did, except the code is a lot nicer and it's using a project that people actually use. So yeah, um, one of the pretty cool things that has been done in Asterisk 11 um, is that for the page application, you know, when it was originally written, it used Meet to actually do the one audio stream coming in and going up to multiple places, i.e. multiple phones. Um, in Asterisk 11, we've actually removed the dependency on Meet Me, and we now use ConfBridge internally. So cases where you may not have been able to use Dottie and thus couldn't use the page application, you now can. And it's got the same feature set as previous, and there's no changes required to, uh, to move over to, to using it, or to have it use ConfBridge instead. So when you upgrade to Asterisk 11, page will just automatically use that. And then media attributes. Um, media attributes are a real internal thing within Asterisk, and we've changed it slightly so that formats like H.264 and H.264 that have specific um, attribute information that's conveyed as part of the SIP setup can now be parsed and understood by H.263 and H.264 capable modules, and this attribute information can be passed from one side of Asterisk to another. So if you have, for example, a Tandberg video conferencing unit that uh, is doing H.264 video, and it has this nice, uh, nice attribute information saying, hey, I have a nice five megabit uh, per second video stream with 1024 by 768. That will actually be conveyed from the Tandberg to wherever you're calling. So if you're calling, for example, um, a soft phone that has video support, then if the other side understands it, it'll just happen and you'll get that awesome looking video going straight through asterisk. Uh, in previous times, that didn't actually happen. No attribute information was conveyed. And because that didn't exist, the video quality was subpar. So that's now been resolved. And as going forward, as new codecs and formats are added, um, they'll probably use this as well to extend the functionality that exists for them. Um, so yeah, once I had the attribute support within the core, I did add support for H.263 and H.264. So in past times, if you have uh, tried that and seen poor video quality, I suggest that you tr give Asterisk 11 a try and uh, see if that improves things. Yeah, for people who are building video conferencing applications using ConfBridge, this should really help out a lot. Yeah. Um, a quick show of hands, because I'm slightly curious. How many people use Google Talk or Google Voice? Wow. That is slightly what I was afraid of. <laughs> um, so in past times, we had two channel drivers, Chan Talk and Chan Jingle. Um, they were from many, many years ago, and as things progressed and Google changed, it, it just wasn't feasible to maintain those, and there were compatibility issues as Google changed things. So over one day, I said, fine, whatever. Screw this, I'm writing something different. I may have suggested it. I was getting annoyed. Okay, well, there you go. You just sort of pushed. pushed me over the edge. <laughs> um, so as part of Asterisk 11, we do have a completely new channel driver that will do Jingle, Google Talk, and Google Voice all in one. Um, it's actually got a better feature set than the other two channel drivers put together, and it's 50% less code to do the same thing and more. And this is actually a core-supported module, so we will try our best as we can to support that. So if you've had issues in the past with Jingle, Google Talk, or Google Voice, then Asterisk 11 will really help with that. We can't help if Google decides tomorrow to bring this back yet again, but we will do our best yeah. to, to, to fix the compliance issues that we've found. So before we move on from this, um, Josh, you want to explain how the name Chan Motif came about? <laughs> is there any musical people in the audience who knows what that is? Like one. I've got something. one. Two. <laughs> so I couldn't. I hate naming things. We had a long debate about the name. <clears throat> we yeah. did, and then I overruled everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we couldn't use Chan Jingle because we already had a Chan Jingle. I didn't like adding a number to Chan Jingle and calling it Chan Jingle 2. I suggested Chan Jingle EX, but I got shot down very quickly. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I knew. I, I have a little bit of musical background, and I knew there was another. There was another word that was sort of like a jingle, um, so I ended up choosing motif instead, uh, which I suggest Wikipedia in that, if you're really curious about that. 
Uh, DTLS SRTP, who knows what that is? <coughs> Not too bad. So DTLS SRTP is one of the mechanisms that you can use for doing uh, encryption between uh, two devices. And instead of sending key information over the signaling, so in SIP that would be in the SDP, um, it actually uses TLS over UDP. And then once that negotiation is complete, it takes some secret bits out of it and uses that uh, as keying information for SRTP. So um, in the end, it's still using SRTP underneath. It's just a different way to get the keying information. And you can also, within asterisk 11, this is supported. Um, and you can, if you have an endpoint that supports it, you can use it. Uh, as well, if you're really highly paranoid, you can have it um, <coughs> renegotiate every, like, every second if you are truly insane. Um, and new keys will be produced. And that um, renegotiation happens within the already encrypted uh, deep, or TLS stream. So on that same point, Kinsey over here spent, what, like two weeks just point, pointing two Astra systems at each other and trying to break this because we could not find an endpoint out there that we could actually get available and actually point it at an Astra system. So if anybody has one, please tell us. And if you would like to go try to break this, please do because, you know, uh, the testing on this was really, really tough since it's such a brand new thing. Um, we found a few endpoints, but none of them would actually allow us to actually point it at, 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 at Asperger's back that user agent. So, yeah. But if you have one, please let us know. <laughs>